Hi, and welcome back to Continual. Tonight on the panel room is a really special conversation. Tonight's going to be a lot about whipping out that pen and charging off to battle as a writer, because we all know that the pen is mightier than the sword, but not necessarily the eraser. I'm your host, Jim Nettles, and let's see who all is coming in to bring in their stories tonight. And Linda, you are up first. Well, hello there. I'm Linda D. Addison. I've won all the horror awards, and uh, I like to write horror, science fiction, and fantasy. Dawn? Uh, I'm Dawn Deal. I write under DS Deal. I haven't won all the horror awards, um, and I write because I must. Aledria. The gremlins can't live rent free. <laughs> yes. Anyway, my name is Aledria Hurt, and I am a writer because the gremlins can't live rent free. And I write horror, science fiction, fantasy, and anything else my little, you know, people upstairs decide is important. Sayla. Hey, I'm Sayla Janelle. I write uh, fantasy, dark fantasy, horror, sci-fi, anything speculative. Um, I write because stories have always been a huge part of my life. They're a part of who I am. And spite. Never underestimate the power of spite. <laughs> Amy. I am, am I write as A.L. Kaplan, um, science fiction, fantasy, usually YA. And uh, I just have to get these stories out of my head or I can't sleep. Jenny? Hi, I'm Jenny Koch. I write the Alien Catherine Kitty Cat series for Doll Books. I also write in a variety of other pen names and in every length and genre. And I write, uh, I really like Sella's Spite comic because I actually write best really angry. And uh, and I also write to shut up the voices in my head. And Elmarie. Hi, I'm Elmarie Wood. I'm a psychological horror author predominantly, but I write in science fiction and dark romance as well. And I write because I was born this way. And I think that really is kind of the answer that sums it all up. We were all born this way to use the written word to do really bad things to our characters because it's still much easier to get rid of the, you know, the body on the page than the body in the swamp. So Linda. Yes. Let's start with the fun question here. What is the worst piece of advice you've ever gotten as a writer? Well, funny enough, not many people have actually said anything to my face that made me want to slap them. So, you know, there's that. Um, I think that early in my career, the thing I felt that was most not spoken is that women can't write science fiction. And that's where I was writing some stuff because I would get magazines like Asimov Science Fiction Magazine and there were no women in there or maybe one story every three months by Nancy Kress. You know what I'm saying? So I actually thought then that I needed to change my name to L. L, L Addison so that they wouldn't know that I was writing as a girl and then I uh, took a workshop with Nancy Kress and she was like well you know Linda if you write your character well enough they won't assume it's a girl and I was like oh wow okay so I just decided to write better and not change my name Dawn? Um, I actually the worst piece of advice I ever got um, when I was in college, I took a writing course with uh, an award-winning author. Um, and he said, I had talent, yay. Um, and he wanted me to come be part of his MFA program. Fantastic. I couldn't because I was a single mother. And he told me that it was a real shame because if I didn't do it now, I would never write and never be published. And I, I think that really kind of threw me you know, for a little while. And it, it really was. Um, I mean, I was I was in my 40s before I really started to write again. Um, and I made sure to email him right after my first book was published. And, and, you know, and he was like, I'm so glad you did it. But I think that was the worst piece of advice, because it would have really changed the trajectory of my life. And I, I don't think I was ready as a writer then. And so that that was it, you know, write when you're ready, not when you, you know, or decreed when you're young. Aledria? Write what you know is probably <laughs> the worst piece of writing advice like ever. And it's the most often quoted piece of writing advice because it, it, te it tells you that you can only write 
in this little box of what your understanding is. It doesn't go on to say, increase your understanding. <laughs> it's like, it, it, it's like, you know, when you get the half of the aphorism <laughs> and you really needed both halves in order to make it work. <laughs> Sayla, how about you? What is the worst piece of writing advice you've ever been given? I'll have two and I'll make it brief because I know we have a big group. Um, so the first one was just trust me. Um, I got into a situation with a publisher and I don't talk about all the nitty gritty publicly pretty much. Um, I was so happy to be signed for a um, book that I ignored red flags and I didn't quite ignore them. I went to other friends and other people who had worked with this person. I thought I knew the situation. Um, I signed the contract and thus began a hellish five years of trying to navigate interpersonal situations um, plus business situations. And it took me a long time to get out of that. So I would say definitely don't blindly trust. Even if you think you've done your research, have people look over your contracts, have a network who can you know balance you can bounce situations off of for sure um the other one that's a little less intense but just as infuriating and fun um i was pitching at a convention to different publishers <laughs> and it was a horror convention and um it was right as i was trying to start selling my work um for real and i was mid pitch with a publisher who was taking pitches at their booth and dude stops me looks me dead in the eye and is like I'm just going to stop you right there because, you know, women don't really do this. They just come to conventions to meet celebrities and get laid. So I, a vendor friend of mine literally saw the look on my face and like came behind me. He was like a big dude and like picked me up and was like, we're going to go over here now and like walk me across the room. So, yeah. Oh, my gracious humans. <laughs> so he saves you before you slug the guy. Like, yeah, he he saved me from someone having to post bail. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I I'm gonna go back way, 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 way back in time here, and it wasn't necessarily advice, um, but it was this pen shaped thing that had red ink that my teachers in grade school used on everything I wrote, and. Um, it, it 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 turned me off on writing for many many years um, before I was able to get the confidence back to start writing my stories again. So, yeah, overuse of red ink. My mother was an English teacher. I grew up with that. She had it's, great love of the red pen. Yeah, there's 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 nothing like having teachers telling you. Oh, you just can't spell. Not try to help you. Just no, you can't spell. You won't amount to much. Mm. Jenny, what's the worst piece of advice you've ever gotten? I've got three and like so I'll go fast. Okay, the first one, going back to teachers. I was in college, I was 15, and this teacher that I knew at 15 was an idiot. Uh, still said, uh, the only way you can write is to outline. And I believed her because she was a teacher, even though I knew she was an idiot. And I didn't write for 20 years because I am an extreme linear writer, as it turns out. And every time I try to outline, and this is before word processing, let me date myself at this moment. Um, and I just, you know, there's this, this wild sheet of paper with cuts and tapes. And I just conceived, con concluded I, I wasn't a writer. Uh, the next bad piece of advice is finish what you start. If I'd finished what I'd started, I wouldn't have a career. Um, I say start whatever you want. Finish what actually is working, what's flowing, what you're ready to finish. Uh, and then the third one is uh, I was at a writer's conference and I was pitching something to someone who I guess she was out of Hollywood, you know, out of Hollywood. Um, and I described a story idea and she goes, oh, it's just like this movie that was made. So no one will want it. And I looked, and honestly, it's nothing like the movie that was made when I found the movie that was made, but it just killed my love for that project, right? 
But and then I come to realize that there are new no 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 zero new ideas under the sun. The Bible, the Quran, every religious text got all of them, and whatever they didn't, Shakespeare just came along and swept up. There is nothing new, and it's great because what they're buying is your voice and how you tell the story. But that was years of pain to get to. But those are the three that were really damaging. El Marie. So this was a hard question to go last on because Aledria and Sela and Jeannie took my top three answers. <laughs> um, so if I were to pick the fourth, it's one that is personal and not necessarily writing advice. It's one I don't speak about very often at all. Um, but I, you know, I've always written psychological horror since I was five. So that's, I mean, literally, that's just what I write. And um, I've lost friends because they said, you know, there's something really wrong with you. Yeah. And they meant it. Like, not, oh, it's creepy. Some sort of, no, something's wrong with you. I've gotten it from a religious perspective. I've gotten it from a psychological perspective. I'm challenging my, you know, mental capacity because I write this thing. And um, the person that I've always been is, okay, that's unfortunate that you think that you and I will not ever speak again, but you know, it's what it is. And like I said, I've lost many, many friends over the years because of that response. I mean, you don't have to like my creepy writing, but you don't, you absolutely don't now have to tell me that there's something legitimately wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And so I think that while um, it's not writing advice, it was, it's not even advice. It was just a critique, but, it, but that critique could have derailed me. Mm -hmm. But because I literally believe that I came out of the room, if I could have written a word in my first day, it would have been something creepy. I think that it, it, that opinion is someone else's opinion. It didn't impact me at all. I've not forgotten it. I think it's interesting, but it didn't stop me in any way, shape or form. And it might have propelled me forward even faster. So I'm going to add a bonus in there just because this is one I've heard a lot, which is the one that says there's no money in it. And why are you wasting your time? Oh, I mean, that. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, there's at least tens of dollars in the in the writing industry. Maybe at least ten. <laughs> I, 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 I can up that. I'm feeling good about it, but no. <laughs> um, I, I can up yeah, on that one. Sometimes hundreds. Sometimes there's hundreds. <laughs> I I have a master's degree in sculpture, which my husband calls a degree in unemployability. Oh my. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I kind of feel like if you can choose not to do it because you're not making enough money, then good on you. I yeah. don't have a choice. <laughs> yeah. And, no, and that's a different that's a different discussion, right? I mean, you have to you do the thing you have to do, but I mean you also have to put food on the table. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you give up this thing. That just means right. you carve out additional time. You know, exactly. this is the yeah. six o'clock in the morning gig or the midnight gig whatever it is whenever you can fit it in you've got to eat yeah. but you know we're not necessarily doing it for the money we want the money sure but that's not the that's when we sit down to write we're not saying this one's going to get me yeah. you know i'm gonna sell this, this is my goal. Goal. So so this is yeah. the one that's going to be you know that's not that's not but the goal point. we just want to put good words down but my point is there's also a lot more value to it than just the page mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah. indeed so, let's start talking about motivation. Let's start talking about, you know, what really drives you. And Don, you sort of started going down this path a little bit about, you know, being told, well, if you don't do it now, you never will. And for most people, that's probably true. But for a lot of us, especially now, we see a lot of people that are coming back later in life. They've got experience. They've got more story to tell and they've got a lot bigger perspective. So for you, what, what, what is it that drives you to write keep writing and and really fuels that fire these days um well i kind of fall in the spike category um you know I, I, there's still this lingering you're never going to do it but the reason i actually sat and completed my first uh, actually published book was because people told me to stop whining and just do it um and you know i think there's still that you know, don't just talk about these ideas, you know, and, and fortunately I'm in a place now where people want, hey, what's next? What's next? What's next from you? Um, and I, that's what keeps me going. You know, I, I, 
how far we can I say I think in some in the ways that writers are introverted introverted attention whores um, because some of us are introverted attention whores I bet. <laughs> Yeah, but we also like spending time in front of our computers. I mean, so I, I think that, that we're, we're kind of both. And, you know, and, and that's sort of a motivator too, you know, um, once you get over the terror of putting that, you know, book baby out there, um, I really want people to love it. And I, and, and that's what keeps, kind of keeps me going. Alidra, how about you? What motivates me? Uh, it's definitely not the money. <laughs> but what motivates me what motivated my first book was the challenge the challenge of getting uh, of creating something and basically creating an act uh, an a shareable hallucination <laughs> it's like my first my first book is it was written through NaNoWriMo it was literally a friend of mine who is like here, here is a way for you to possibly write a book. So go do this thing. And I looked at it and said, I don't know if I can do this thing. She said, I bet you can. And I was like, okay, challenge accepted. <laughs> so how about you? What keeps that fire going? Um, a lot of things. I feel like storytelling is kind of how I process life. Um, you know, if I I would, I would be doing it anyway. So I, a lot of things in life, like I'm walking around, you know, it's a lot of what if this happens? What if that? So putting that into stories is just kind of how I process the world. Um, might as well put it out there and try to get paid for it. Um, I really started trying to get published. I tried like in my early twenties um, and got discouraged pretty fast. And then as I was turning 30, um, I had a weird health scare. It ended up fine, but it really kind of made me stare things in the face and being like, I've avoided submitting and trying to be published. What if this could be something that makes me really happy? So I gave myself, you know, in true like Sela fairy tale fashion, a year and a day to just submit, 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 and see what happened. And I started getting acceptances and it went from there. Um, currently, and like I said, I make the spite joke. I don't quite, I want to clarify that I don't mean like I'm going to show everybody a little bit of that, but it's also that I feel like that it's this big willpower. I'm like the most inhumanly stubborn person on the planet at times. So in the past few years, I've had medical mystery tour part two, um, a little bit longer. It's very frustrating, but you know, dealing with that, dealing with other massive life changes, um, the whole publisher thing and like literally having pretty much everything I'd out there having like every rights reverted back to me for different occasions. And it has been hard. I will like, this has probably been one of the hardest stretches of my life, but I realized that I still want to do it and I still want to see what happens. So it's partially maybe wanting to prove to people, but prove to myself, but also, you know, this is who I am. And Let's see what happens. There's there's this part of me that it's either really great or really stupid part of my personality where I go for the things that scare me to see what happens. So it's like, well, this has all gone wrong. So what's going to happen if I just keep going? Maybe maybe something better will happen. We'll see what happens. So it's a lot of that. It's a lot of just this weird drive to push forward for better or worse. <laughs> Amy, how about you? Uh, well, I, I've been creating stories for pretty much as long as I can remember, but didn't get the confidence to start writing them down until I was post-grad school, actually. Um, but I, if I don't get those stories out of my head, I literally will not be able to sleep because I'll keep writing them in my head over and over. This doesn't work, we'll try this that doesn't work we'll do it again i i would go through scene after scene after scene the same one like dozens of times before i would move on with the story in my head um so i i just got to get them out uh or or i'm not i'm not happy it just it stresses me out if i can't get them out so that they they've got to get down there and i'm just so glad that i can now get them on paper 
because when I started, it was, oh, we're going to illustrate this, the, the art route thing. I have sculptures that I based my stories on because that was the only way I could get them out at that time because I didn't think I could write. I had too many people, teachers, tell me, oh, you can't spell, you'll never be able to. Thank the I thank the day someone at college said, hey, we have a computer lab. It has uh, word processing, which at that time was still very new, and good old Multimate with that disk, and that was when I was finally able to do some writing because I could fix that misspelled word that I didn't identify and spelled three different times on the same page. Jenny, how about you? What keeps the fires going? Well, uh, the voices in my head, literally. Um, like Amy, remember, I was 15 and told the only way you could do is outlining and the word processing was not really around. So I would try, and I just assumed I wasn't a writer. And like Amy, I was running scenes in my head. Unlike Amy, I could, uh, well, I'm assuming anyway, I could pass as fully present while I was doing that. And I never was. <laughs> I was never fully present ever. The front part of my mind, oh, yeah, 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 you would never know. I knew, but you wouldn't know. But I was never fully pre present in anything, anything, because I was running these scenes in my head and doing this and making the characters do that. Yeah, maybe I don't like that. Maybe I don't. Oh, yes, your question. I got your answer, right? So the sanity that came back when I finally, the voices were so loud. And I just started writing to shut them up. All of a sudden, the characters are like, okay, yeah, we can wait. You can be fully present now. huh?" Right? And the being able to be fully present with people and actually catch all the nuance and everything else and know that I was present was really wonderful. And that is one of the things that keeps me going. And also the voices just do not stop. And new ones come in all the time. Anytime there's a lull, um, current characters are whining, oh, but new characters, hey, here's another new series, right? Look at us, waka waka, right? They're walking across, they're doing their thing. Older series, you know, you owe everybody the next two books in our trilogy. You love us best, right? It's just a constant battle. So really getting to write is, is how I get to stay sane and present. So. Pain. All right, so El Marie, how about you? What keeps your insanity safe? <laughs> yeah, but I don't have, it's funny. My motivation is to try and touch people. I like to come up with these stories. They're fun. You know, it could be anything can can give me some sort of inspiration. So I'll go write it down, and then I'd like to see if anybody's impacted. You know, and when I say touch, I mean I'm a psychological horror author. I don't mean you know warm anyone. I mean frighten them. I'm, I'm trying to frighten them. <laughs> Let me be clear about that. But, you know, I, I want to see if I can do it. If I did it with this time, with this this scenario, can I try it a different way? You know, so I'm constantly trying new things to see if it, if they work and see if, you know, people walk away going, yeah, that was terrifying. But, you know, and that's good. If it, if, they, if that happened, that's, that's going to keep me going. If it didn't, I'm going to try and figure out how to, you know, fix it and make it happen. So, yeah, I mean, I don't, it's not the, I just want to scare people. That sounds horrible when I usually say it like that. That's the answer. <laughs> Some people like being scared. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's I'm not one of them, but <laughs> a service. It's a service. You're a giver. Yes. That's right. I'm a giver. There we go. There we go. I'll take that. Linda, how about you? What keeps those fires going? Well, I mean, I heard a lot of, of bits and pieces from each person that already spoke. I mean, I have been my earliest memories have always been daydreaming and what if, you know, daydreaming about a cat. What if it had wings, you know, and that kind of thing. So I was never really like here. <laughs> 
either. So, um, and I was the oldest of nine. And so since my mother, in order to have nine, had to be pregnant all the time, um, I had to take care of the rest of them. And I used to tell stories and make up stories. And so, and my mom made up stories for us. So when I went to school, kindergarten, first grade, and sort of realized that not everybody told stories all the time, and their mom didn't, there were no books in my house. So I was, I mean, we, we you know, food was like a thing. So books would not. <laughs> so I was just, I just always been that way. And that's how I'm, I still am. I mean, I, and I'm driven by the stories, the characters that come to me. And then I figure out, find out, oh, this is horror. Oh, this is science fiction. You know, I don't really um, do that ahead of time. And as long as I'm happy with it, then my next move is to see it in print because I know a lot of writers who need to write because they're driven to write, but then to, to put it out there and submit it and deal with rejection is a whole nother level. I don't care about rejection because I really need to see my name in print. I need to see it in a book, bookstore magazine. I mean, I don't know how to explain that. Someone with more psychological background can explain that for me. But <laughs> so I'm just like constant. My last breath is going to be me thinking of coming up with something this in my head. Yeah, I'm still going to be late for a dead deadline three weeks after I'm dead. So, <laughs> Yeah, I used to say what motivated me were deadlines, but since I have sailed so far past most of them, that that is, that is a rude statement to my editors. I don't say that anymore. There's nothing like hearing the, the, the whiz of a deadline as it goes flying by your head. It's just so, so exciting. So, Aledria, mm. you know, one of the things to me, and this is this is part of what drives me as a writer, is the power of being a storyteller to let me explore the things that I need to for me. It's that idea of I'm diving into whatever that is because there's something in the back of my head that says, oh, let's go see. And, and inevitably, there's some part of us that emerges in characters and in story and lets us sometimes carry those things to absurd ends. So, Aledria, what's what's one of the more important things that you've learned about yourself, about process, just from being a writer. Yeah, you know, what's what's one of the things that you've been able to do in terms of self-discovery, in terms of why these things are important to you? I've discovered a lot of things about myself, most mostly what actually scares me. But I mean, because you know, the visceral reaction that you get, or even the things that make you happy. You feel them in your body when you write. You literally feel this, like your heart starts going when you're when, when you're writing a scary scene. And they there's the old adage that says no no movement in the writer, no movement in the reader. So it's like if it scares me, and I'm literally just putting the words down on the processor. <laughs> maybe it's gonna scare you <laughs> and then the other most important thing I think I've learned other than just what scares me is what makes me happy does the activity of writing make me happy which it does it makes me very happy to spin yarns <laughs> Even as my day job, my day job is to spin yarns about an old house. So that's what I do. I either am speaking the story to to a group of people, or I am writing down a story for a group of people. But I start out telling the story to myself to entertain me. And then it goes on to something else. I mean, it's great to have an audience, but I start out with an audience of one. Taylor, how about you? What have you what have you discovered about yourself through writing? I think gosh. I I've discovered that I think writing has allowed me an avenue to be a bit more vulnerable than I sometimes am in real life. I'm like, I grew up as a minister's kid. And I think sometimes 
because you're so public facing, I, I don't know how it is for other people, but I got the impression that was kind of raised that, you know, you, ha you have to be on at all times. Um, you know, you have to present this good image and uh, you know, whether that's true or not, or whether my parents enforced that, that's a subject for debate that's here or there. That's sort of just how I grew up, what I believed. Um, and I was a theater major and worked in theater for a long time. And image was very, very important there. So I tend to have a very long fuse about things. And I tend to be a little bit more careful with how I am just in like life until I know people really well. Um, but Ryan, I think has really helped me open up and be vulnerable um, with my characters, you know, to express these big emotions, you know, with everything I've gone through the past few years, I've had all these great ideas that are like, I call it like my season of feminine rage. <laughs> like there's a lot coming. That's just this well of emotion. That I really want to process. And because some people think even me at my tamest is this big, awful, horrible, angry thing. It will be interesting to see like what, once I let that loose in my characters for realsies, how that works. So it's given me this opportunity to explore my emotions and helps me to be a little bit more open in real life too. I'm, I'm getting there. Um, but, and I think too, process wise, it's been interesting because, um, when I was working in entertainment, um, I sewed and designed and things like that. I had this long stretches of time where I'm doing everything with my hands. So my brain could always be clicking and plotting and outlining in my head. So by the time I went to write stuff, it was just like really easy. I don't have that anymore. Um, I need to be using my brain like for other stuff during the day. So for me, it's taught me to have self-compassion to try new ways of plotting new ways of you know okay if i'm getting all pent up about this you know why don't we just start a bunch of ideas and see what kicks or why don't we save the cat it out and do a bunch of like index card outlines or is flash gonna work so it's it's trying to give myself permission to try different stuff um and see what works for me now and to develop new processes and just give myself permission to reinvent myself in process and in in my work Amy? Um, well, I've always been the, the quiet little wallflower, the one that put on the smile and cheerful to, to everyone around me. Um, but with the writing, I've learned to embrace that darkness that's inside me uh, that I don't show anyone else. So I can put it into my characters. And, and I know um, some of the people I know, when they read my works for the first time, they were like, where, where did this come from? Is, is, is this, this isn't our Amy. It's like, oh, surprise, actually it is. I just never shared it with them. Um, and uh, I'm able to get it out in my writing, which is uh, another thing. And, and, and. Then I got it out in my writing, and hey, now suddenly I can talk about it. Uh, I can, like, I have depression. It's under control right now, but that was something that I could never talk about. Childhood friends hadn't a clue. So I didn't let it out anywhere. But now I'm, I'm, I'm able to. So I've, 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 I've learned to accept what's inside of me. Is, is what it comes down to and get it you know I, I'll put it into my characters but I'm more comfortable with who I am now because I've started to show that put that in the words was that coherent yes. <laughs> okay Jenny uh, I prove that I'm a writer honestly I, my, I have a very odd background that is a an entire three hour panel of itself and we're not going into it here but I have um, I have long ago adopted the uh, total truth policy because then you can't hold anything over me ever. Uh, so I didn't have to discover anything like that because I was already telling everything. Ask me a question, and you'll get the full and complete text answer. Um, but I spent 20 years thinking I wasn't a writer and merely, you know, crazy, kind of, right? I'm talking to all these people in my head. I'm rearranging what they're doing. I'm doing all this stuff. So the actual discovery that, holy crap, I'm actually, oh, if I do it the way I'm wired to do it, 
I am an author, right? And um, uh, the first fan mail was very exciting because that's also kind of per- it, I remember one of my friends, I'm like, oh my gosh, she goes, how did you think you were going to have a any kind of best-selling book without fans? I'm like, oh, I just assumed I'd have readers, but not fans, right? It never occurred to me. So that I am a writer, that is the discovery. I am a writer. This is my, you know, one thing. Uh, this is the thing I'll do whether anybody wants to read it or not. Um, but the discovery that it was, that's what writing gave me. Uh, that and the sanity. <laughs> the sanity was nice to me. El Marie, how about you? What's what have you discovered about yourself? Well, I I think it was more of a solidifying a fact that I really do dance to the beat of my own drum. I I, I just really do. It's always been that way. It has nothing to do with the well. I guess the some writing. Um, I'm a pantser, and I never cared about that. I, I don't care that I'm a pantser. I don't care that other people don't like that I'm a pantser. They're outliners. That's absolutely fine. I don't dislike your style. So why do you care about mine? Right. <laughs> and um, you know, I I I I can outline. I don't want to. I I don't want to do that. I I don't want to do that. Right. And so I I don't and never have and and just I'm fine with it. And I've always been that way. Do you know what I mean? It's just never been a, a thing. I'll wear I, I love to wear maxi skirts with a graphic tee and, and, and sneakers. Like because that's what that's my style. That's what I like. That's that's what's up. You know what I mean? And it's like I I, I accepted myself. All I I've just been I don't know how that's like I recognize how um lucky I am that I have that awareness of myself and have always been okay with it. So I recognize that, but I've accepted myself, but I used to think, yeah, that's a little eclectic. But no, it's just me. It's actually not. It's just me. It's El Marie. Um, I'm going to write what I want to write. I, I, what I want to, what I, I want to write is psychological horror and I just do it and claim it and have never not claimed it and will always do so. Even though I'm dipping into mystery and, you know, dark romance and sci-fi, but you know, psychological horror is what I write that sit, it straddles the line of everything. So I'm not even doing anything differently there. Um, so as a writer, as I continue to put out the stuff that is inherently me, it just kind of keeps going with the mindset of because, so I'll write something and I'll, I'll put it out and I'll say, of course I like it because I wrote it because I wrote it the way I always write it. You know what I mean? I wrote the thing the way I always do the thing. And this is me. I write, anyone who, who knows me, who has heard me speak of my, my, you know, how I, you know, I write a lot. So, but I'll write when I can, but when I can is like midnight to three or 4 a.m. And then I'll get up and do the day job because that's who I am. That's what I want to do. And it's, it's, um, I think that it's been gratifying to see that it's everywhere for me. Like it's all aspects of my life. It is, is that, you know, I, you literally can in any, at any con you will likely see, if you see a maxi skirt, it's probably me. When I turn around, my shirt's probably Medusa. Like, for real. It's just what it is. And don't be surprised. If you see somebody wearing a whole lot of orange, yeah, that's me. I usually have so- I usually have something orange on. I mean, my phone is orange. There's something orange on me all the time. So it's, it's life. And I, I think that um, it's been nice to see it just continue to reflect or show itself and manifest in everything that I do, including the writing. And since we now have your memoir title, it's me, it's El Marie. That's right. Oh yes, that's perfect. It's me, it's El Marie. I like that. <laughs> so, Linda, how about you? What What have you discovered about yourself through through everything you you've written, you've done, your process, all of that? What have you discovered about yourself? I think the the first thing, as I'm listening to everyone, I was just thinking because I'm I am trying to actually write an autobiography. Ha! Ah, Let me tell you, hardest thing I ever thought I'd write. Um, The arc of my life to this moment is so massively different. I was super introverted. I lived in fear the first 18 years of my life in my home. I didn't talk. I read everything. I mean everything. Shakespeare, Poe, Langston Hughes, everything I could get my hands on because it was the place I felt safe. 
it fed that ongoing um, daydreamer. That person and me now has been a continuing journey of, of, of just so much curiosity. Like, why do people behave badly? Why do people hurt each other? Why do people hurt me? I mean, what's going on, you know, in here, way in here and reading about it, psychology, everything, everything. And coming to the person that I am today where I can see someone behaving badly, whether it's because I'm a woman, I'm black, I got tattoos, um, I'm not 18, whatever the situation is for that other person, and be like, wow, that's so not my problem. And be more like, hope you uh, reincarnate as human. That's my favorite line. But, <laughs> but before now, before the journey to being able to detach mm -hmm. myself and my worth from what other people would try to make on me. I was always like, I got to be better. I got to be faster. I got to be smarter. I got to always responding to other people's fear and brokenness. And I don't now, which is a wonderful place to be. And as, as has been said before now, I mean, not that I ever lied, but who I hit a lot from myself because I didn't, it was hard to face it. When I first started, I wrote science fiction. I started writing horror when I was able to face the horror that was in my real life. And then the horror that's out here in the world. And it's become a wonderful thing feeding my writing. And I feel very safe with now, but I remember not being safe at all anywhere. And now I feel safe everywhere I go. Big arc. <laughs> Don? Um, I, you know, when you get last, people have touched on it. I really, um, I liked what Elijah said about, you know, it has to originate with the writer. And I'm agreeing with you completely. And I write erotic romances. <laughs> I'm trying not to laugh, but it's true. Um, you know, I think it's true, true in any genre. And, and Amy's people looking at you sideways. Yeah, I do. I, yeah, I got a lot of that. Um, what I learned uh, about myself as a writer, um, but because I really came to it much later in my life, not that I didn't write the whole time, but I didn't see myself as a writer, um, is that writing is a place where I have ultimate control. And there is so much about this world that I can't fix, no matter how much I want to, um, that this is, you know, it's my kind of safe space. I can I can make it all happen. I can make it come out right. I can make the guy get the girl, even if she does have to kill a monster on the way. Um, because I'm, you know, mine's pretty dark as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and and that's it. That's what I've learned. It's about control. It's about controlling a world. Um, in a place where we have very little. So I mean, ultimately, it, it's all about story. I mean, it's all about the stories in our head, the ideas in the head, the way we, we've got to get them out. So, Selah, for you, what's the power of your story, the stories you bring to life? You know, what is it you want to see come out of that? You know, what's the influence? What's And if somebody wants to know about releasing their own stories, the power of their own stories, you know, what is it you would tell somebody that, Kind of helps them all in that way. Is um okay for me personally. I mean, there there are themes and things I found continually to flow out. Um, it, it's kind of like if you look at what's out now, you may not see it because, like I said, a lot of rights are reverted, and I'm working on getting a lot of stuff back out. Um, and horror, my horror stuff is usually more short or thematic around whatever. But for my longer stuff, I think it's a lot of I like exploring the crumbled cookies a lot. I like um, showing that people aren't perfect and there's still a place for them to belong. So people belonging and, you know, understanding people's emotional truths is really important to me. Um, also kind of exploring systemic issues and, you know, how women are treated, how, you know, people of different, um, you know, aspects are treated is important to me as well. Um, that trickles in my fantasy work a lot um i want to, to really show that characters have value and i want readers to 
be able to explore that their emotions are valid mm-hmm. and that they have value as well. Um, in terms of like what people should hang on to, like as writers, whatever, for I would say something that, okay, here's the deal. We all want to kind of, I think at some point, even a tiny bit, even if it's not, you know, the forefront, if we're being really honest, that fantasy of I'm going to publish something, it's going to get a movie deal. I'm going to be a gajillionaire and be the next Stephen King or whatever. Yeah, we all have that. It's a dream. It, it look, it, it's, if it happens, fantastic. But I think people need to get away from that goal and focus on find their own personal reason for writing. Cause if you don't get that, if that's going to destroy you, then that's a problem. Um, you know, it's for me, it's fine. Yeah. I want my name in print. I want it all. I want the movie deals. I want all that stuff, but I get the reality that it's very, very hard. I know maybe one or two people who have like movie money and who don't have to have a day job or whatever, maybe two or three people who don't have a day job anymore. Um, it is very rare. So, and that, that's fine. Um, you know, if I get it fine, if I don't, okay. But I think you need to find your own reason for writing and hang on to that. And if it changes, fine. You know, you need to just keep finding your own reason for doing things and not just focus on the goal and let that propel you versus I want that to be the next James Patterson or whoever. (laughs) Amy, how about you? Um, I think I saw that her read the, the question a little differently. Um, uh, for, um, uh, what all kind about of influences? You. I mean, it's all about the power of your story. About what my is, story. Yeah. Your stories, your tales, the things. My, my tales, the, the things, well, I, I didn't even notice it until after I'd had several things published and lots of stories written. I, I do have a few reoccurring themes that happen. Uh, one. I keep blowing up Earth. Uh, I don't know why. I just wipe it out and then just sort of rebuild it however I want. And the other thing is there is in almost every story I've written, and I didn't set out to do this. This just sort of happened. There's this underlying theme of be who you are. And in fact, I got that on my license plate now because it just, it's there. I'm, I mean, um, in, in Star Touch, it's all about my main character being afraid of accepting who she was. Um, and then, you know, the end, she, of course, she gets that. And, and, and I did the same thing in, in all the other stories. I did not set out to do that. It just sort of happened. Um, so I, I guess that's probably something I'm hoping people will pick up um, to to be comfortable with with who you are and what you can do and and just be accepting of yourself and others. Jenny, um, I was always very aware of themes that authors have, like Clifford B. Simics is is the evolution of man, for example. So. I realized that I had these, you know, you're like, uh, my themes in almost everything are sex and spirituality. Sex is the cure for what ails you and spirituality is out there and everybody's got some, um, uh, some kind of spirituality, even if it's anti spirituality. Uh, so that's, that's in there. Um, what I try to do though is not hit anybody over the head with it. So my goal in, you know, 50% of what I write is to make you laugh. And, um, and I'm, I, I'm right. I'm creating entertainment. Yes. There are other, there are levels and layers and yes, especially for the rereaders, they'll get really rewarded when they catch on to stuff, especially, um, in series as they go through and there's a call back to something and they get it because they've reread. Um, so those are my themes. I, I don't really stray from them. They're there and everything. Uh, whether I'm being funny or horror or, or meaningful or whatever. Um, you know, I have currently seven published pen names and more on the back burner. So I can do it. I'm doing it all in the crazy train. Um, <clears throat> so I guess, though, what I would tell 
there's lots of things, you know, never give up, never surrender uh, is one. Uh, if you want to do it, do it. But the other thing um, for the people that complain that it's just so hard, uh, do something else then. The rest of us are tired of hearing it. Okay. I just do not want to hear one more person walk up to me and whine about how hard it is for them to write. Well, I'm like, I'm going to slap you with a boot on both sides of your face. Right. If it's too hard for you, my God, anything else is easier than this. Anything else probably has a better, better financial stream to it than this and, and everything else. So if it's that hard for you, move along and do something else and leave it to, leave it to the others, leave it to everybody else. On the other hand, if those characters won't shut up, then again, never give up, never surrender, but just stop whining about it and just do it. I come out of marketing, you can probably tell. <laughs> I'm using everybody's slogans. My theater person sees your marketing person. So Thank you. for Simpatico. <laughs> hey, especially, especially slap with a boot. Yeah, I mean, that, now I'm just... Thank you. Thank you. El, El Marie, how about you? So I, I want to be sure I'm answering the question that you're asking. You, you're asking... What is it in our writing that we want to see permeate readers or writers or what, and what advice do we have for writers? Is that? What do you, you know, from you, for you, from your perspective, mm -hmm. the power of story, the story you're, you're telling, mm -hmm. what is it you want to bring in the world? What is it you, you want to share? What is it you see as the power of your story? Okay. Um, as I've mentioned, I like to scare people, but I also want to have them think, um, I, you know, I do a lot of that deep thinking myself when I, before I, before I sit down to write, as I'm thinking about something to write, or just in a general sense, there have always been questions for me um, about the life we're living and if this is it, and if there's, you know, or, are there other um, realities happening at the same time that, you know, you know, split consciousness, all that kind of stuff. And I think that thinking deeply about things is where you know the the creativity comes in and i'm just the person who happens to be writing it down so i want them to and then well of course with the way that i like to write it down i'm going to have you think about it and then be terrified by what we come up with right but um so if i were giving advice to any author who wants to sit down and write my my answer would be just go ahead and do it there's no reason to wait just do the writing. It's not about being perfect as soon as you put it down, right? You know, as soon as you write it down, it's not about being um, eloquent and, you know, having all these wonderful turns of phrase. I mean, those things will come. And that's what editing is for. I mean, frankly, the, you write a first draft, then you go back and you look at this whole thing. And I mean, every time I sit, I mean, my, my, because I'm a pantser, I just kind of keep going, right? At the end, I look back and I'm like, ooh, and then I end up adding like 10,000 words. I've almost never taken out more than I, you know, it's just because there's some parts I didn't expound upon, but this is the editing process. That's part of writing. So just write the thing, but write the thing that resonates with you. Don't try to be like anybody else doesn't mean that your style won't be like someone else's. I'm not saying that you, you can't help it sometimes, but don't sit, you know, st go out to try and sound like someone else because you're chasing a dollar that may or may not exist for that author. You know, you don't even know if they're getting paid the money you think they're being paid. I mean, I'm, I'm always astounded at how much people think authors make. I'm just like, what? really? I mean, where did that come from? Well, I, we all know where it came from. Stephen King blew up and he has to be making the money, right? But not every single person's making all of that money. And I'm just astounded. So don't chase a dollar that could it may or may not be real, but it's their dollar anyway. If you're if if you're looking at someone that's their dollar, seek your own dollar, but the dollar shouldn't be the focus. The story should be the focus. Why do you want to tell the story? It should be the thing that make, wakes you up at night. It makes you sit down and write. It should be the, you know, your answer to that question of, oh, is there an alternate reality? Well, answer the question, make it up. You make it up, you know? And so I, I think that too often people are trying to emulate something else and they need to really just figure out what they want to do and be honest with themselves about whether or not they want to do it. Because as Jeannie said, this is not easy. Why would you do this to yourself if you didn't really want to do this? <laughs> right? <laughs> So yeah, I guess that's it. I mean, for me, I, I want people to think and subsequently be frightened by what they come up with. 
or what I come up with. I'll, I'll plant it for them. That's fine. I'll plant the seed. That's fine. But I'll, then if it's if you're a writer, I want you to just do it. What did Yoda say? There's no try, only do. There you go. That's it. I quoted Yoda today. Twice. Believe it or not, I've quoted Yoda twice today. So anyway, <laughs> that's it for me. Linda, how about you? What What do you want to see come out of the power of your story What when you share it with people? Well... I think it's really interesting. I love hearing different people's points of view. Like everyone here is fabulous. Um, I do a lot of mentoring. You know, I do a lot of mentoring young writers, and I don't mean young in age. I mean young in, in how long they've been writing. I also teach a poetry workshop to anybody. I'll teach poetry to anybody because I kind of feel like everybody's got it in them. Literally, the best poetry comes out of my workshop of people who've never written a poem. So when I'm mentoring which is the same as when I'm writing, I write very organically, you know, although I can take a theme, I've learned to take a theme, I put it into the crazy daydream machine, and I come out with something. And, and since I've been doing it for a long, long, long time, uh, <laughs> a lot of what the poetry does work very well in rewriting and editing, because there's editing to be done with that. I think it's really important to write from your authentic self whatever that self is. For me, it's the daydreamer. It's the, oh, Linda, write us a poem about an apple. I can write a poem about an apple and be talking about um, low-income housing. You know what I'm saying? I've mm -hmm. been doing it so long, I can take anything and shape it, and it'll be entertaining. And then I've been told, because only people, other people can answer what my theme is. I don't know, because I'm so organic in writing. I've been told that in my writing, uh, there are no real victims. And I do believe that in life. I believe you can be victimized, but you don't have to be a victim. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm working with someone who's writing, I think my biggest thing is I want them to write authentically and they don't have to show it to me. I need them to just do that. Just dig in. If you're writing because you want to win awards, I can't help you. I even know I've won a lot of awards. I don't write to win awards. So I can't tell you how to do that. Find somebody else who could, you know, but I mean, people have different reasons for writing. I write because this is what I hear all the time and have for many years. And if someone wants to come in and do that with me, I, they will. And I've had people I've mentored who are now and have been blowing up. And it's just like, so joyful. It's like, I'm winning when they win. And it's not because I've done anything. They don't write like me. But I work with them to like, let's get, let's dig in there. I don't even need to see it because I'm not a therapist. I don't need to see your stuff, but you need to see your stuff. So you can write from there because that's what's going to make you different. And that's what's going to make you special. And my point's been pro proven because like I said, there's people out there now and they shine and I'm like, yeah, you go. <laughs> so, you know, that's how it is for me. And then part of that process when I mentor is, is if they're in to be in with me, because not everyone is, and I get it, it's all good. Then I'm like, What's the biggest uh, thing that you've ever wanted to be published in New Yorker? Asimov was mine. Took me 15 years, but I got in there after I got in four times in a row. I'm just saying. You know what I'm saying? Like, what is your biggest goal? Because I feel everyone has greatness in them, whether it's writing or baking cookies or whatever. So reach high. And that's how you learn that rejection doesn't actually kill you. So, you know, like that's that's like Linda's boot camp. It's a weird place. <laughs> And I do it with myself. <laughs> so Dawn, how about you? Um, let's see. I um I don't actually usually write with a theme in mind, um, but I have found myself continually revisiting um you can either put a stranger in a strange land or Alice in Wonderland. Um and 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 that's not even leaving Earth. I mean, I have plenty of paranormal. But some of my most stranger in strange land are just sort of na navigating life. Um I'm a huge fan of Easter eggs, a huge, huge fan. Um, my first book was based on Dante's Inferno. The more you know about Dante's Inferno, the more you'll find. Um, and I think that's just because I'm I'm on the young end of a, being a gamer, but I, you know, I think I sort of come from this gamer mentality. Um, I 
for I was a teacher, never used a red pen, swear, hand on heart. And I and I hate outlining. I abhor outline. I had to teach it, but I abhor outlining. Um, and so I did get to see, you know, right, I was handed a creative writing class. And um I, I just had to keep saying over and over again, just just write. Quit stopping yourself. Yes, you can write whatever's in your head. Oh, it's too weird. Doesn't matter. Get it out. Get it out. Get it out. And that and that would be, you know, my advice. Just no matter how strange or off the wall or perverted or whatever, just write it. Um, and then, you know, we can make it better. But I, you know, I can't do anything. I can't help you unless you get those words out. And and that's what I would tell anybody who wants to write. We can't help you. None, none of the people here can help you until you put those words where we can give you direction. Even if we never see it, even if we never read it, just that conversation. But until you have those words, um, the, you, you're not a writer until you put words down. And, and that's what I would say. Aladra? My biggest theme tends to be around family. It tends to be around finding the family that is for you as much as finding the family that you are born in and actually knowing the people that you're born to. Because just because you're born into a family doesn't mean you know jack crap about these people. <laughs> So it's like, that's my major theme. But as far as like advice I would give to the next set of people coming along, hmm, be you, you be you, do it, do it your way. If you're going to, if you're going to be a plotter, a pantser, a planter, whatever, who cares, do what you do. <laughs> Make it, make it happen the way that you want to ha have it happen because we can't, like Don said, we can't fix a thing until you sit, uh, until you sit down and you commit to putting some words down. Once you've committed to putting some words down, then we can have a conversation about, uh, about where you can go from here. But, as long as it is still living up here and it is not on paper, mm -hmm. you're still in daydream land. That's a good place to be, but it's not going to make you a writer. Mm -hmm. Well, I think after a night of writers, we filled up a blank page. <laughs> it's coming in to go editing us. But um, before we get out of here, you know, the, the one thing I do want to mention as well, I think hopefully everybody takes away is that being a writer is not a solo sport. It is not one of competition, but it's one of a found family. So before we get out of here, let's make sure everybody else knows where to come and build on to this family. So, Linda, how about you? Websites, social media, and of course, if you got website is easy breezy, Linda Addison Writer dot com. Um, I have two things, one that's out already, and that is the uh, Black Women in Horror Magazine Special Editions. Out is free, it's beautiful. Like online, it's just like an electronic, beautiful magazine. And then I have um, an, a really cool poem story coming out in an anthology. This month, it, it may be out already, the Way of Silk and Stone Anthology. Um, I, w I wanted to say the first word, but I'm, I, ooh, Sonam. S O R G H U M. Sorghum. Sorghum. Thank you. Okay. And spear. And spear. Thank you. <laughs> the, the way of silk of silk and stone anthology. I'm super proud of being in that. It's connected to um Nichelle Nichols. And I couldn't be happier to be part of anything that's distant or close connected to her. Don, how about you? Um, uh, you can find me at dsdeal.com and it's D-E-H-E-L. So it looked like to hell. And Friday, actually, um, all of my Irish gods books, there's four of them are being released. It's a bundle. So you, if you go to my website, there'll be a link. There's a link to it if you want to pre-order it, but it's a good deal. You get four books for $10. So go do it. Aledria? Aledriahurt.com. Just recently, my uh, me and some Twitch buddies put out a uh, streamer's anthology called Futures Lens. 
which just recently hit the shelves. And at the beginning at the beginning of the year, I put out my sci-fi YA called A Line. Sayla? Uh Sailajanel.com. So that is S-E-L-A-H-J-A-N-E-L dot com. Um, and I have some standalone stuff on Kindle and KU, but most recently I've got um, a story in the old ways through Erie River. Um, my first time being published in Canada. I'm super stoked. Um, talking about themes, for some reason, magic trees and weird trees are like a thing with me. Never realized it till like the sixth or seventh time they showed up and people being eaten by trees is like a thing with me. So if you like that, <laughs> I got that. <laughs> Amy. I I am easy to remember alkaplanauthor.com and alkaplanauthor on social media. So take a look uh, and uh, uh, check out my website and uh, then take a look at Mark of the Goddess, which is uh, my latest short story out. And you mentioned uh, trees. Uh, I have a, a, a sort of a carnivorous plant that will eat your people if you're not careful in in that one so I love it. oh and i uh if anyone is going to be at raven con next month i will be there jenny uh jennycoch.com i'm on twitter way too much on facebook and pinterest uh, supposedly on Instagram. Yeah, still not really active there yet. Um, yes, Aliens Like Us is coming, I swear to God, but that is not a new release. I don't have a new release at the time. But I do want to mention that Linda and I are both in Predator Eyes of the Demon together, which I was super. Yeah, we are in there together. Let's talk about female predators. That's I'm not right. yes. female and predators. Female fighters I'm just fighting saying. And female fighters from mine. Female fighters fighting female predators. So, That's right. Yeah. Same. So we're in that. And that is still, that is awesome. It's also available on audiobook, which is also, they did a really good job at the audio. They so. did. That and Black Panther's audio is a lot of fun, too. I'm in that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and El Marie. Oh, you can find me at elmariewood.com and on Twitter, elmariewood1. Um, I am also with Linda in the Black Women in Hard uh, free, beautiful magazine that's out now. It is truly gorgeous. Really, really gorgeous. So please do check that out. Um, I have just well, two weeks ago released my novella and short story collection combination. It's uh, the open book and the Tales of Time. It's kind of a fun like a companion piece there. And the second book of the Affinity Saga called Origins will be out on the 20th. Was that Monday? So yeah, a couple things. And I have had the host or pleasure of being your host this evening, Jim Nettles. And you can find me at jamespnettles.com, authoressentials.net, authoressentialsworkshops.com, creatingprose.com, the Speculative Fiction Academy. You com. saw me duck my yeah. head, right? <laughs> what is oh, Marie? Oh my God! The Speculative Fiction Academy is a place you can go if you want to learn how to do any of this stuff. Anything, right? Anything. Sci-fi, horror, <laughs> fantasy, exactly. Poetry, screenplays, and Jim is one of our instructors. And last but not least, you can always find me here continual because they never let me escape. <laughs> Blink twice if you need help. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Go take care of that blank page. That's what will stalk you at night. We'll see you soon. <laughs>